As long as I'm President of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley, and welcome to our podcast. Today, I'm joined again as my co-host by uh, Richard Atwood, Crisis Group's Chief of Policy. Richard, uh, good to have you again. Thanks very much for having me on. So the the topic today, our main topic, is going to be talking about events in Myanmar. They were just elections just took place, but some of the oldest conflicts, long last, longest lasting conflicts in the world, are taking place in the, in that country. And so we'll be talking about it with uh, Richard Horsey, who's a Crisis Group Senior Myanmar Advisor. And I'm sure we're going to learn a lot because I don't know of anyone who knows Myanmar as well as Richard does. But before we do that, I thought we're going to also bring in Olia Olaker, who's our Program Director for Europe and Central Asia, to talk about what's happened in Nagorno-Karabakh in the last week since our last podcast with a Russian brokered ceasefire. And, and because it, it's so, so significant, we thought we wanted to have her perspective. So that's on the menu for today, Richard. Any thoughts before we start with Olya? Well, actually, before we turn to the Nagorno-Karabakh ceasefire, what I'd actually like, like to ask you, Rob, is about the piece that you published in the New York Times, I think, last week with a former colleague of yours, uh, Phil Gordon. It's a piece that I would say, tell me if this is wrong, a pretty damning assessment of President Trump's foreign policy record. Obviously, Trump's foreign policy legacy is a bigger question. I'm sure that the podcast will return to it in, in future episodes. But something struck me when I was reading it, and I've been thinking about, which is this sort of question of tone versus substance. Now, how much was President Trump departure from previous presidents, from traditional U.S. foreign policy? Obviously, there's a big spectrum of traditional U.S. foreign policy. But how much was he a departure in, in tone, in what he said, in what he was prepared to say? And how much was it really a change in, in substance over the past four years? I mean, it's a good question. I think it's a little bit of both. The tonal differences and sort of the attitude differences were the greatest break, and those have consequences. I mean, if you speak about autocratic government, if you speak about democracy, if you speak about multilateralism in a different way, it does have an impact on the way the world looks at things, and it gives sort of different ambitions to different countries. Substantively, he's done some things, and we could talk about how he's tried to shift the trajectory vis-a-vis Iran, vis-a-vis the Israeli-Palestinian conflict vis-a-vis China. But I think you're right. Four years is a short period of time. Even eight years is a short period of time. I witnessed that under Obama to substantively really change the massive ship that is the United States. If you'd have two terms of, of a President Trump, I think then we would have seen more major substantive shifts about how the U.S. relates to the rest of the world. But I wouldn't underestimate the damage that he's done in terms of the U.S.'s ability to have any credibility on some of the issues it's going to raise. And again, shifting some of the terms of the debate. So I think you raise a very a fair point. I think you, there's another point you're not raising, which is a point that I've made for some time, which is on the one issue of substance that we might have worried most about President Trump was whether he was going to be a, a warmonger or a peacemaker or somewhere in between. He is the first president, and many people have said that, in many generations not to have begun a a new war on his watch, which is a significant substantive departure. He may not have done it for for all the right reasons, but it is something to at least credit him for. He's now moving in the direction, perhaps, of withdrawing precipitously from theaters in which the U.S. has been engaged, which, as I've written, is a good instinct. Unfortunately, he's giving his good instinct a bad name by doing it, perhaps in the most uh, cavalier fashion, whether it's from Afghanistan, whether it's from Iraq or elsewhere. So I think you're right. It's a, it's a nuanced picture, but I'd say overall, the balance sheet is, is decidedly negative. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and as you say, he hasn't started any wars, but he also didn't have a, he didn't have a 9-11. He didn't have the Arab uprisings, the breakout of wars in the Middle East. He had the pandemic, which was a very different type of crisis. You know, I think sort of broadly speaking, in many parts of the world which have not been on his radar, the U.S. has either been absent or policy has sort of continued much as it would have done under a different president. It's places that are sort of very geostrategically significant, places where he's had an interest or his administration has an interest where I think there's been a real departure. You know, I, I think for many leaders... People are going to be very relieved that there's a new administration, that the four years of President Trump will be over. On the other hand, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the election wasn't a strong repudiation of 
President Trump. I think in the back of many leaders' minds, there'll be the fact that he may be back in 2024 or, you know, a more competent version of him may capitalize on the base that he's leaving behind, uh, which would be be something quite different. So although you can paint quite a nuanced picture of the impact of everything he's done, if you look at different crises around the world, the broader picture you paint, I think that's right. And and two quick reactions to that, which would be a bit of a segue to, to Oli and to Nagorno-Karabakh. It's not over yet. I mean, as you say, number one, I think the message, and we say this in the article, uh, the message of the seesaw, the yo-yo of U.S. Uh, politics between George W. Bush and what he did in Iraq, President Obama and what he's done more generally, and now Trump, it's really very hard for foreign countries to have any sense of continuity of, of U.S. policy. So none of them are going to look at Biden and wonder, is he just an interlude before we come back, as you say, to President Trump or another version of him? And so even though they, they may be relieved, some of them may not like it, some will be relieved, but they won't know how long it's going to last. So that's one respect in which his legacy still endures. But the other thing is we still have about uh, two months or so during which he will still be uh, in office with the full powers of a commander-in-chief. And as Phil and I wrote, there's a lot he could do. And even in the, since the time that we wrote it, which, as you say, is about a week ago, a lot of the things that we worried about seem to be coming to fruition. There's talk about a quick withdrawal, perhaps, from Afghanistan and Iraq. There's talk about designating the Yemeni Houthi rebel group as a terrorist organization. And there's been talk in the New York, New York Times piece that came out in the last few days that Trump uh, wanted to and may still want to engineer a military strike against nuclear facilities in Iran. Those are all things that Phil and I had worried about. I think Phil's son <laughs> wrote to Phil and said, you know, why did you have to give them all these ideas? I think they, they had the ideas before we, we wrote it, but it is still a worrisome thing that you have somebody who has full power and may be thinking about consolidating his legacy and complicating President-elect Biden's path forward. So we're still living with it. And we're living with it in the sense that the U.S. doesn't is basically absent from the world scene other than perhaps in these ways for the next two months. Will countries take advantage of it? I've been sp- wondering whether... Azerbaijan, the timing of what it did in, in Nagorno-Karabakh might have been related to the conviction that the U.S. wouldn't be involved. That probably is an overstatement. But in any event, the U.S. was not involved in trying to resolve that conflict. Russia was, and that does bring us to Olya. So, Olya, great to have you. Very glad to be here. And I'd love for you to maybe say a few words about what, what happened. I mean, what did Russia achieve? And from your perspective, how would you rate how positive its its uh, intervention has been and what it means for the conflict between Armenia, Azerbaijan, and, and Nagorno-Karabakh. So the deal that the Russians are able to broker um, the night of uh, November 9th to 10th is basically an Armenian surrender, right? The Armenians are on the verge of losing. What they agree to is Russian peacekeepers uh, in what the part of Nagorno-Karabakh that Azerbaijan hasn't taken control of. And the Armenians hand over authority over the territory surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh um, that are still in Armenian hands to Azerbaijan under this phased plan where basically by December, Azerbaijan is going to have all of the territories around Nagorno-Karabakh and a big chunk of Nagorno-Karabakh itself. And then Russian peacekeepers are on another chunk of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is connected to Armenia by a corridor through this Azerbaijani territory, which the Russian peacekeepers will patrol. So that's the deal. Oh, and all of our Armenian forces are to leave all of these areas, right? Armenian forces only in Armenia going forward. A corridor between Azerbaijan and its exclave of Nahichevan, which is on the other side of Armenia. And Turkey and Azerbaijan should lift the blockade that they've had on Armenia for the last 30 years. So that's a lot of stuff. It is an agreement signed by three leaders. It's not ratified by anybody. But pretty much as the ink is drying, Russian peacekeepers start arriving, Armenian forces start leaving, and it's getting implemented, right? It's holding. Everyone's fulfilling it. The chaos in the Armenian government, but still fulfilling it. A lot of questions in Azerbaijan, the constitution of which says no foreign forces on Azerbaijani soil, But if the Russians are in Karabakh and the Azerbaijanis claim Karabakh, that's Azerbaijani soil. So how does that work? Lots of questions. What's the Turkish role? 
no one knows. Uh, the deal says refugees and IDPs can all come back. It looks like the idea is Armenians go to the territory that the Russians are on and Azerbaijanis go everywhere else. But how does that actually work? So we've got a ceasefire, but we don't have a peace, which is what we had in 1994 also. So the question is whether we can get to a peace now. Anolia, what should we be looking at now? What are some of the things you're, you're worried about? You talked about the disturbances in, in Yerevan, obviously Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan under a lot of pressure. Uh, you talked about some of the ethnic Armenians that have left both the adjacent areas and Nagorno-Karabakh itself, some still there. What's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to some of the sort of the cultural heritage sites? You know, what does Turkey get out of the deal? Do we know what Turkey's role is? Is it the Russians that are protecting Nagorno-Karabakh? Do, do we know? Do we know how they're going to do this? And I think more broadly, referring to your last point about how you can move this from a ceasefire to, as you say, a, a peace deal, how can the, the blow of this be softened, you know, really, as, as you describe it, a terrible blow for Armenia? How can that be softened? Is there anything that outside powers can do, Turkey and Azerbaijan themselves can do, Russia can do to sort of sweeten what has been a very bitter pill? So, yes, all of those questions. And I think we don't have the time to go into all of it, but Russia is effectively taking on the role of the protector of what I've been calling Rump Karabakh, right? The part that Azerbaijan hasn't taken control of. I think, actually, I think antiquities and religious sites are going to be really important. The extent to which Azerbaijan can be, shall we say, gracious in victory and make it possible for Armenians to visit religious sites. A lot of the people who are, are evacuating these contiguous areas, the territories around Karabakh, they're taking everything for fear that it's going to be destroyed. And there have been a lot of debates between Armenians and Azerbaijanis over you know, who has historical rights to this territory, and then so they fight over how old these antiquities really are. You know, this would be a good time to stop fighting and say, if you're Baku, we're going to protect them, we're gonna take care of them, we're gonna make sure people can visit. But I think long term, lifting the blockade for real and bringing real economic development that connects this region could make a huge difference. Now, the parties, including Turkey, aren't going to do that alone. I think they're going to need additional economic incentives to make that happen. But you need to create a system where people get more out of peace than they do out of war. And that's going to take some time. And I think tempers are going to be very high for a long time to come. So it's really difficult to ask people to be rational and to kind of think about the future. And that's a lot on Russia to try to do it on its own and to try to negotiate it. And then there's the question of, will the rest of the international community, what can they do to help? Do we need a UN mission to look at how civilians are treated to provide that kind of monitoring? Because less than 2,000 Russian troops can't do that, right? So who does it? Great questions, Olia. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. I will say for anyone who's interested on this and other European issues, you're the host of a, another podcast, partly an inspiration to this one, uh, War and Peace. And so it covers all matters European. I would say just as a concluding thought, you know, Crisis Group and others like to say there is no military solution and then fill in the blanks to what the conflict is. It turns out in this case that there may have been a military solution, and sometimes it's a statement of hope rather than a statement of fact when people say there's no military solution. I do think that it raises questions about the whole enterprise of, of mediation and peacemaking. In some cases, the quickest solution is a military one, however terrible it is, and, and as you say, it may plant the seeds for the next conflict if, in fact, the solution is one. That one side, in this case, the Armenians' views as humiliating, tantamount to surrender, and thus inherently unsustainable. But... I think that's a question we're going to have to reflect upon in this and other conflicts. I mean, they could have had a negotiated solution uh, just like this or one that was better for Armenia at any time over the last 30 years. Yeah, probably one that would have been better for them than, than this one. And thousands of people would still be alive. That's, that's absolutely right. Thank you. We'll have you back. Thank you. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Talking about a conflict that, uh, for which there doesn't seem to be any solution, whether negotiated or military, it does bring us to Myanmar. And Richard Horsey, as I said, you are senior Myanmar advisor. It's really great to have you on the podcast. Great to talk to you, Rob. So I want to start, for those of our listeners who may not know that much about Myanmar, to give some context. I said earlier that some of the ethnic conflicts that are taking place in Myanmar are some of the longest running in the world. Maybe just give a sense for those who may not know Myanmar, but in brief about 
the history of these conflicts. What, what are we actually talking about when we talk about ethnic conflicts in, in what used to be known as Burma and now called Myanmar? Well, you know, Myanmar has been in almost constant internal armed conflict since the Second World War erupted, basically. There was no gap after the Second World War, after the British left, the insurgencies started almost uh, immediately. And while today those insurgencies, there are some 20 or more officially recognized armed groups, uh, several of those continue fighting the central government actively. Many of the others have tenuous ceasefires. Today, the conflict is organized very much around ethnicity, but it wasn't always like that. At the beginning of the conflict in the, in the late 1940s and 1950s, the big question that newly independent Burma was grappling with was ideological. Which brand of leftist politics was right for the country? You know, something that many post-independence countries thought about and fought about. The difference in Myanmar is that that didn't stop. It's kept on rumbling. And over time, through foreign interventions, the Chinese Kuomintang troops invading uh, as they fled, as Chiang Kai-shek's uh, army fled uh, partly into northern Myanmar, uh, interventions from the Americans in response to that, then the Chinese backing a, a communist insurgency in Myanmar. So there was, there was all these escalations due to foreign intervention. And then as the ideological fires started to die down, they were replaced with something else, which was an ethno-nationalist identity battle, where all of these different ethnic groups in the highlands started to resist against a domineering central Burman state. They'd never previously come under the authority of a central state. Even under British times, they were allowed basically self-rule. And so this was really a question of state building. And it never has finished. And so you still have these huge areas of the uplands which see themselves as sort of rightfully self-governing peoples who are still uh, resisting what they see as domineering, violent uh, suppression from the center. Richard, could you say something about the ethnic insurgencies now? There are groups, from what I understand, armed groups that are part of a peace process, that have agreed to a ceasefire with the government, that are armed groups that are outside that peace process. And there are others that are involved in active fighting uh, against the government. Could you tell us a little bit about what the different array of groups look like and where the violence is taking place? So the challenging thing in Myanmar is that you do have a peace process almost a decade old. You have still intense armed conflict in other parts of the country. And these two things aren't really linked. There's really not much of a link between the peace process, which deals with groups that haven't been fighting for some time, mostly uh, on the Thailand border in the southeast, there's some very difficult discussions going on there about how to turn these ceasefires into some sort of more durable political agreement around autonomy and, and rights and so on, as well as demobilization and demarcation and other more military and strategic issues. And then you've got these conflicts up on the Chinese border and, of course, uh, in Rakhine State uh, on the Bangladesh and India border as well. Those armed groups are not involved in, in the peace process. The peace process doesn't really touch them. And so you have this conflict dynamic and this peace process dynamic, and they are completely separate worlds. And so when people talk about you know, improving the peace process, as currently conceived and with its current membership, the peace process is about further consolidation of ceasefires you know, in, the, in that Southeast area. And that's, a, that's, that's been stable for some time, partly for geopolitical reasons, partly because Thailand has long since given up any support or tolerance for armed insurgencies on its border, because the economies of these areas can't sustain the level of warfare that was once there. Basically, resources, uh, natural resources are not lucrative enough to really sustain intense warfare. The trees have all been logged down, uh, roads have been built in. So... In that part of the country, conflict is not sustainable. In other parts of the country, peace is not sustainable. And in those other parts of the country, that's where you have a lucrative illicit economy, particularly uh, the main engine of the illicit economy in Myanmar, methamphetamine. It's the biggest methamphetamine producer in the world. Uh, it's a $60 billion a year regional industry centered on uh, Myanmar's part of the Golden Triangle. So you have that engine of money, basically, and an engine of grievance that's been there for 70 years and more. And those two are coming together in a very toxic way. And, and uh, you know, that, that's been the history of the Golden Triangle going back decades, but it's not getting any better. Richard, can we talk a little bit more about Rakhine State? Because I'm sure many listeners will be familiar with what's happened to, to the Rohingya. You know, this terrible expulsion of 
three quarters of a million Rohingya across the border to Bangladesh. But I think what's also interesting is that there's some of the most active fighting in Myanmar now is actually taking place in Rakhine state, not involving Rohingya, actually involving the, the Buddhist Arakan, the Buddhist Rakhine people who played a role in the expulsion of the Rohingya, but are now fighting the government. And again, we'll come to the Rohingya in a moment. But from what I understand, notwithstanding all the other reasons why it's very difficult for the Rohingya to return, until there's a calming of that conflict, until the violence gets under control, it will be almost impossible for the expelled Rohingya to go back. Could you say a little bit about what's driving the, the conflict between, I think, the Arakan army now and the, the Myanmar military? Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is, a, this is an old grievance. The, the Rakhine used to have their own kingdom right up until just before the British arrived in, in, in British Burma. Um, they, were, they were an independent kingdom. They were taken over by the Burmese kings uh, 30 years before the British arrived. And so their life under Burmese rule was very fleeting and quickly replaced by British colonial administration. And Rakhine was one of the richest parts of British India, one of the richest parts of the British Empire. Um, it had flights to London through Sitwe, the capital of Rakhine. It had uh, produced a lot of lawyers and doctors and intellectuals. It was really a, you know, a bit of the jewel of British Burma. And if you go today, you see that it is one of the most impoverished and marginalized parts of the country. And that's at the heart of the Rakhine grievance. They, in their historical imagination, are proud, independent people who were briefly subjugated under Burmese rule. The British arrived and then they got marginalized, suppressed and, and impoverished through what they see as a sort of deliberate impoverishment. That links into why there was such intercommunal tensions as well, if we go back to 2012 and the violence then and the expulsion of the Rohingya by the Myanmar military in 2017, because the Rakhine people felt that their culture their polity, their state was weakened by decades uh, of, of oppression and marginalization. And at a time of weakness, there was this population that they had always distrusted of Muslim Rohingya, who they saw as this kind of vanguard of Bengali power. I mean, I think that's a, that's a pretty strange way to see the Rohingya, uh, you know, uh, from our eyes, but they felt that they were at risk and that this population was growing and represented a sort of second threat. The first threat was, was the violence of the Burmese state, and the second threat was the sort of demographic threat of this disliked Rohingya population. And that, in an essence, is what's been going on these last decades in Rakhine State. After the expulsion of many of the Rohingya, there are still about 600,000 left, it wasn't long before Rakhine people's anger turned to their traditional enemy, which was central Burmese power. And in January 2019, that dormant sort of very small insurgency rapidly escalated. Now, there's an illicit economy story here as well, because over the last five, seven years, Bangladesh has emerged as one of the biggest markets for Myanmar-produced meth. So there's this drug trafficking superhighway going from Shan State in the northeast of Myanmar across the country to Rakhine and on to Bangladesh, this, this huge market for drugs. And it doesn't take much imagination to see that if you are run, running an insurgency and you are controlling that territory, you have taxation ability, you have other ability to tap into that illicit economy. And that's really what has allowed the Arakan army to field a multi-thousand strong, well-armed professional force that can take on the Myanmar military. No other insurgency in the last 70 years has been sustainable in Rakhine State because geopolitically they haven't been backed by, by Bangladesh. Economically, Rakhine State was a backwater. The economic rents weren't there to sustain a major army. But the drug trade has changed that. And so you have this, again, combination of grievance and the economic means to translate that into insurgency. So it really shows, again, the complexity of, of the conflicts. But the, if much of the world knows or has heard about Myanmar recently because of the, the tragic fate of the Rohingya and, and what's happening in Rakhine State, the other reason people have heard of Myanmar is the iconic figure of Aung San Suu Kyi, this woman who many in the West at least saw as another Nelson Mandela who fought for democracy or at least freedom from the military dictatorship, who was under house arrest, who won the Nobel Peace Prize and, and ascended to the highest level of power in Myanmar. And again, in the eyes of outsiders, and I, I really mean Western audiences, her story, sort of this tragic rise and fall from grace, uh, is the story of Myanmar. It's 
clearly more complicated than that. And, and Richard Atwood and I were talking about it yesterday and wondering, does this say more about Myanmar or does it say more about the West's projection of its own views on Myanmar? And so I'm curious, you followed this very closely. I should have mentioned that you've lived in, in Myanmar for about a quarter of a century. So that's why I say it's hard to find somebody who knows it as well as you do. But what do you make of this? I mean, what's your interpretation of, of, of her, what she has meant to Myanmar and why perceptions in much of the rest of the world have shifted so dramatically? You know, for many years, Myanmar was portrayed as a kind of morality tale, right? It was a very clear black and white story of good versus evil. And we love those because there's so few foreign policy situations that can be characterized in, in really simple, morally clear terms. And, and Myanmar seemed to fit the bill. Of course, it was never so clear. It was always complicated and messy. But, you know, you had the sort of almost stereotypically bad military hunter, and you had this almost stereotypically angelic figure who spoke pitch perfect British English and was the daughter of the independence hero and was standing for human rights and democracy. And so because Myanmar wasn't important in other ways, economically, geostrategically, it allowed foreign policy fantasies to play out. It enabled boutique policymaking to play out. You could be, you know, a politician in the West who had to make difficult choices on, you know, the Arab world or weapon sales to, to here or there. And on Myanmar, you could show you had an intact moral compass. And so people weren't really interested in the complexities. They weren't interested in the military regime and what it actually wanted. Uh, and they weren't interested in really finding out before she took power, what did Aung San Suu Kyi actually think about the Rohingya crisis, about, about this population? What did she actually think about nationalism? Uh, what were her views? It wasn't really interrogated. And if it had been, uh, people might have had pause, not to question Aung San Suu Kyi's unparalleled popularity in Myanmar, but to question the simplicity of what had been projected onto her and onto the country. And of course, I mean, this brings us now to the fate of the Rohingya, which is where you know, many people feel Aung San Suu Kyi has fallen most short in her sort of failure to, to condemn what's happened, you know, let alone prevent it. So, Richard, 700,000 or three quarters of a million Rohingya now, as far as I know, in Bangladesh, uh, parts of Bangladesh, with, from what I understand, very little prospect of, of coming back anytime soon. You know, how do you see their, their, their future? How are their relations with the Bangladeshi population in areas where they are? Is there any hope that outside actors can have any influence in, in speeding their return, but certainly in, in looking after their well-being where they are? You know, the really tragic thing is that there is no obvious solution to the plight of the, of the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. As you say, the chances of them returning to Myanmar in large numbers anytime soon is very, very low. Um, the chances of them being integrated into Bangladesh's society is also very, very low. You know, Dakar is absolutely uh, insistent that, you know, we are not just accepting this refugee caseload and, and allowing them to sort of integrate uh, quickly into, into Bangladesh society. That's for them letting Myanmar off the hook. Uh, that's how they see that. Uh, and there's no third country resettlement possibility for that number of people in today's world. And so relationships between the refugees and the host population there's more refugees, many more refugees than host population, it has to be said, in, in Cox's Bazaar. Uh, they are deteriorating and getting quite tense. Uh, the local population has, has faced a lot of challenges as a result of this huge influx. And the initial welcome has turned to frustration that, that nothing seems to be changing. Obviously, with the pressure on humanitarian budgets and, and the further increased pressure on humanitarian budgets as a result of COVID most likely, uh, it's going to be more and more difficult to get the billion dollars a year that are needed to sustain the lives of those peoples in, ca in camps. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's a search for solutions. And it's very clear what, what the right solution is. It's very clear what the refugees uh, have the right to, and that is the right to return in dignity to Myanmar. But that doesn't seem very likely for a very long time. This is Hold Your Fire, a podcast from the International Crisis Group. We're talking to Crisis Group's Myanmar expert, Richard Horsey. So that raises a question that, that Richard, you and I have discussed you know, for years now since I came back to Crisis Group, and it's one that we see around the world, but it, with particular salience in the case of Myanmar, is 
What tools are available to try to influence that government's behavior, whether it's vis-a-vis the Rohingya or any other one? And that is a question that came up during the time of the military dictatorship when Crisis Group was at the forefront of trying to shift international policy away from the blunt instrument of sanctions, saying that you know that was could be ineffective or counterproductive. But for an organization like ours, it's always looking for ways of shifting different governments' policies and sometimes running into brick wall. What have you learned from your time in Myanmar about the most effective ways, if there are any, that outsiders could bring to bear to try to move things in a more positive direction? And how do you grapple with that dilemma? It really is a dilemma because everyone wants to do something about this situation. Politicians want to do something about this situation. Human rights advocates want to do something about this situation. And just saying sanctions don't work isn't very satisfying for anyone because It's a tool, it's an easy tool, it's a tool they have. But the fact is that Myanmar, as a relatively small country squeezed between giant neighbors of China and India, has always been acutely aware of the risk of being overrun or squeezed by these giant neighbors. And it's produced a strange political pathology in Naypyidaw, I think, which in a sense does not offer concessions in response to pressure. And that's not just the current government, that's not just the military regime of the past, it's in the political DNA of Naypyidaw. And the reason is that if you are being squeezed by a giant like India or China next door and you start giving concessions, there is no end to that because there is no end to the capacity of your giant neighbors to squeeze you. So the only way you can survive as an independent country during the last Cold War, uh, as it was, was to show that you don't feel pain, you don't make concessions, you continue with what you were gonna do without deviating. And the world has learned this again after the 2017 expulsion of the Rohingya because all of the pressure that was there, all the tools that were available were brought to bear. The UN Security Council, which didn't turn out to be very potent, international opprobrium, foreign leaders flying in and warning Myanmar that, you know, if you don't change course, you are imperiling your transition, you're imperiling your newfound uh, relationship with the West, Uh, you are going back to being over-reliant on China and your neighbors, which was a situation that you didn't want to be in. All of those arguments are true, and Napidor is sensitive to them, but they didn't cause a deviation in the course that Napidor set right at the beginning of this crisis. So I think if we think that ratcheting up sanctions as a blunt pressure, just you know, more pressure will produce some magical solution, we're wrong about that. If we weren't wrong, so it's not about the sanctions, it's about us being honest with ourselves about whether we are genuinely trying to change the situation, trying to improve the situation of the Rohingya, whether we have a viable theory of change that sanctions play a part in. So it's not about being against sanctions. It's about being against not having a viable theory of change and just using sanctions as a substitute for a policy rather than as part of a policy that might actually work. Now, there are other reasons to have sanctions. Uh, There is... uh, you know, there there is clearly a signaling effect, there is clearly a moral signaling effect, which certain forms of sanctions can play. There is a, a, you know, clear need for accountability for what happened. And that may lead countries as they have to put certain sanctions on military individuals who were responsible on the military as an institution. This is very different from the kind of broad based economic sanctions that were around in the past. And those are the blunt Uh, tools, right? It's not to say that those targeted sanctions on the military are going to change the military's actions. But if you accept that that's not the purpose of them, the purpose of them is to demonstrate, then uh, they have a logic. And in that sense, are are coherent. Uh, It's it's this sort of idea that you just increase the pressure, a magical solution will pop out. And uh, that's not feasible. So what's the alternative? I think what's positive is that Myanmar does not want to be in the situation that it's in over-reliant on China again at a time of potentially a new Cold War emerging where you know Myanmar will be among the front lines of that, of that Cold War. That's not something they're comfortable with. They see that they need to counterbalance China. They know that their other friends in the region are probably not strong enough to, to act as that counterbalance, which means they still want a strategic relationship with the West, particularly with the US. They also know that that's out of reach. But that gives a starting point to a conversation. It gets the US in the door, 
to work on the diplomacy and work out what can we do not to sort of, you know, have a magical fix to this almost insoluble problem, but to make progress and define benchmarks and engage in that. And I think that's the space that has to be worked. It's not the space you would want to be in because honestly, it means that there isn't going to be a single easy solution to this in a, in a short political time frame. But the alternative is to not make use of that political space, to use the blunt tools of the past, and that for sure is not going to improve the situation of the Rohingya. And we will come back to this in 20 years, as we did after 20 years of sanctions in the past, and say, where have we got to? We've got to a much worse situation. Thanks for that, Richard. I have to say that was one of the most uh, thoughtful and cogent exposition of the dilemma we face, certainly in Myanmar, but elsewhere around the world. We're going to have to end soon. I do have one more more personal question, but I want to say, you know, just listening to you, I hope uh, those of us who are listening with us can see why you're such a treasure for us. I must say, whenever I get a draft, there's a smile on my face because I know I'm going to learn a lot and it's going to be beautifully written on top of it. And I'd say Myanmar also brings to bear so much of what Crisis Group is now trying to cover as we sort of evolve, not just the political identity conflict dimensions, but the role of social media, the role of economics of conflict, illicit economies, the role of climate change. And so Myanmar is in a way a laboratory for so much that we are also trying to to understand. But I want to come back to sort of a, a personal question. I traveled to Myanmar with you. I mean, you live there, but I was there, what was it, about a year ago obviously saw your love for a country that you have lived in for almost a quarter of a century, discovered that you were a real foodie and you introduced me to sort of forms of cuisine that were unbelievable and I can't wait to go back. So, you know, part of the the point of this podcast is for people to understand why someone like you would suddenly not just fall in love with a country, but want to understand its conflicts and try to resolve them. So could you just tell us briefly, because it is a fascinating story, how you got involved in Myanmar, how you first got introduced to its conflicts and uh, what kept you there for all these years? Yeah, so my first professional engagement with Myanmar was for the International Labour Organization, which, uh, as you know, is the, is, the, is the labor standards branch of the UN. And at the time, this was the mid-90s, Myanmar was sort of the poster child globally for forced labor and child soldiers. And so that was kind of the key issue in terms of human rights in the country. And so I worked for 10 years for the ILO on these issues traveling to Myanmar. I met with Aung San Suu Kyi uh, several times when she was under house arrest and met with the military leaders at the time. We were trying to negotiate and, and end the government's use of forced labor for mass infrastructure projects. It was, it was really a quite horrific uh, situation. Uh, and eventually we got an office opened in the country. So I, I went to, to open that office and you know, ended up negotiating with that uh, military regime on, on individual cases that were brought to my attention of, of forced labor. Basically, people would complain to me as a kind of ombuds uh, person, and I would take these cases to the higher authorities and try and negotiate a, a solution. Sometimes it worked. We got, you know, 20 child soldiers out of the military back to their families. Uh, sometimes it didn't. And uh, sometimes the people who complained ended up getting arrested I was threatened many times. They weren't very comfortable with having an international working on human rights issues. So I guess after, after 10 years of working for the ILO, I sort of thought that it was time for a change. And I had to basically decide whether I stayed with the ILO and became a, a labor person or whether I stayed in Myanmar and became a, a Myanmar person. And uh, Myanmar beats the ILO. <laughs> and so here I still have today. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Uh, really, thanks for your time. It was, it's always enlightening and good luck out there. Thanks very much, Rob. Great to talk to you. And you too, Richard. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. So, Rob, can I ask before we end, what else is on Crisis Group's radar this week? What are the other publications people should be looking at? You know, first I want to take a minute to say sort of, wow, I've spent a lot of time with Richard, the other Richard, but every time I listen to it, I think I learned so much and I really would recommend people to go back. Some of these publications uh, have a short shelf life, but I think all our work on Myanmar has been sort of cutting edge and so informative. So I would tell people, go back if you want to learn about the country and read what Crisis Group has been publishing for so long. But yes, there's a lot that we've been writing about in the last week since our last podcast. We spoke about Nagorno-Karabakh. We had an immediate statement that, that said a lot of what we've heard from Olya. Yes, maybe the guns have fallen silent, but if this is perceived as a humiliating defeat for the Armenians, you're planting the seeds for the, the next generation to try to pick up and try to regain what was lost. So I think that's one that people could look at. 
a report on crime and COVID-19 in Mexico and the Northern Triangle, looking at what is a de facto a conflict, given the huge number of casualties as a result of that. So that's, that's what I would recommend for our listeners. And we'll have more coming in the, in the coming week. Okay, thanks so much. Look, why don't we end on a slightly different note this week? One of my favorite podcasts is called uh, Reasons to be Cheerful. It's hosted by Ed Miliband, the former Labour leader in the UK, and Jeff Lloyd. And each week they discuss potential fixes to some of the world's problems. But they start by asking each other what their own uh, reasons to be cheerful that uh, that, that week uh, ha- have been. So it could be something personal. It could be a book they've read or a film they've seen or something that's happened that's sort of uplifted them. Obviously, this is a a podcast where we talk about a lot of stuff that's not uplifting at all. So I thought maybe we'd end by me asking you, what is your reason to be cheerful this week? Huh. Reason to be cheerful. Well, one one thing I mentioned, and this is maybe more serious than what you had in mind, but my brother, who you've gotten to know a little bit, he's an infectious disease doctor. And I must say, he's been a real pessimist since uh, COVID-19 struck. He's been right most of the time, I have to say. And for the first time in the past week, he struck a note of optimism. I mean, as you know, he usually curbs his enthusiasm. But the two vaccines that seem to have been developed, uh, Moderna and uh, and Pfizer, has put a smile on his face and he can't believe how successful they seem to be. So that has been one reason for optimism and for, for, for cheer. The other is one of the benefits of confinement is that we got a puppy and... and uh, Seeing that puppy grow has been has been a pleasure. I know that's you have a dog too, but let me turn the question back to you, and then we'll have to end. What's what's been uh, one of your reasons for cheer? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, certainly the the dog is always a reason to be cheerful. So yeah, as you know, we found our dog Chicho on the beach a few years ago in in Italy. Adopted him, and he still gives me a lot of reasons to be cheerful. But I've actually got something you know even more geostrategically significant for my reason to be cheerful, which is that. A friend of mine in, in Italy a couple of years ago gave me this banana plant sapling, a baby banana plant. I planted it. It was a, a disaster. It was dying, wasn't getting enough water. So anyway, this summer, I took it out of our garden in Italy and I brought it back to Brussels, of all places, where there's very little sun. But it's actually now sitting in a pot on my windowsill and it's about five foot tall. It's booming. It's amazing. <laughs> and I'm looking at it now and this is definitely my reason to be cheerful this week. Well, on that note, that's it for this week. Thank you to Richard Horsey. Thank you to Olya Olaker. Really great having both of them on. Remember, if you have any questions, to send them to media at crisisgroup.org. We'd love it if you could leave a rating and any review uh, to iTunes. And uh, as usual, a huge thank you to the Crisis Group team that puts this together. Have a good week, and we'll be talking to you next week. Hold your fire a podcast by the International Crisis Group.